Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to tonight's Artists and Artists. I'm Kelly Kivlin, Associate Curator here at DIA. And I know we have an unusual scene arrangement, so I'm going to step away from this other microphone. OK. So there's a couple seats up front for those that are looking for seats in case you need them. You can come over by me. Um, we're so thrilled to have Andrea. Oh, you can come over here. Yep, sorry. OK. We're so thrilled to have Andrea Geyer with us tonight. Um, it's an incredible pleasure to have us um, have her be part of the series that has welcomed over 70 artists. And um, her reflections and her dedication to this event and engagement this evening have really been truly a pleasure to work on together. Um, I just want to first say thank you. Uh, the series would not be par possible without the support from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, as well as to Brooklyn Brewery for the beverages. And I want to also thank Max Tanone, who has helped um, on the logistics this evening, as well as Andrea Avia. And um, we have several other colleagues here that have been a part of DIA, DIA's history, DIA currently, that were actually um, witness to and part of the event. Uh, when Dia commissioned Chantal Ackerman to um, present at Dia Center for the Arts um, in 2001. And that event took place at 545 West 22nd Street, which was just a couple doors down. It was a live reading, um, and it was in October of 2001. Um, so you can just uh, consider the context there. And the evening was a live reading that was a reflection, it was a fictional story, but it's a reflection on family, on community, on silence, um, and many other things. So, um, 17 years later, we're here tonight, and Andrea will be speaking on Chantal, on that work, as well as many other works. Um, a little bit about Andrea. She was born in Germany in 1971, and currently lives and works in New York. She studied in Germany um, before graduating in 2000 from the Whitney Museum's Independent Study Program. Um, this month, she opened an exhibition at the Park Galleria in Mexico City, and other recent exhibitions include the Irish Museum of Modern Art in Dublin, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and the Goethe University uh, in Frankfurt in 2017, as well as the Museum of Modern Art and the Whitney Museum of American Art. That's in the last five or seven years or so. She's also a professor at the New, New Schools Parsons School of Design, and she's been there since 2009. In, 20, uh, in 2007, Geyer's Spiral Lands was selected for Documenta 12. It's a photographic and text-based work that focuses on the dispossession of land from the American Indians and the role of landscape photography in this ongoing process of colonization. A cycle of works in three chapters, Spiral Lens is an early representation of Geyer's research-based practice, but often through the female-identified characters and voices, engages a viewer in the process of rethinking the past in present times. Since then, Geyer has presented her projects at Tate Modern, and also a commissioned performance and installation that maybe you've seen, Time Tenderness, which was for the, for the opening of the new Whitney Museum uh, in 2015. These projects are also part of an ongoing work by Geyer titled Revolt, They Said, an ongoing wall-sized diagram in which she delineates a network of 850 women without whom the American cultural landscape would not be as what we know it today. While I was reflecting on, sorry, while I was reflecting on Geyer's practice and in considering the context of this evening, I would like to share an excerpt from a text um, in her 2009 book with Sharon Hayes titled History is Ours. Quote, Traditional history as a discourse facilitates a distancing of the audience as well as the author, removing both from actual responsibility towards the issues at stake. Yet, we all know that history is experience, written within a body or across bodies. Putting myself on stage might seem a simple gesture, but it created an undeniable presence of a body that was calling out and addressing the audience directly and indirectly as bodies themselves. Andrea wants to begin tonight with an acknowledgement that we, that we are on the unceded territory of the Lenape people. 
She would like to acknowledge and pay her respects to the Lenape ancestors and to present and future generations on this homeland, as well as throughout the Lenape diaspora. She would like to also extend this acknowledgement to all indigenous peoples who now and in the future call these Lenape homelands Lenape Oking home. This acknowledgement is a commitment to the process of addressing the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism and to actively work to dismantle these. She would also like to thank Dia and her time that she was able to spend with Chantal Ackerman, as well as Sally Hughes, Zuna Maza, and Janine Schiff in supporting her research at Dia, as well as Lynn Cook, Barbara Clausen, Matthew Buckingham, Josiah McElhaney, Barbara Schroeder, Karen Kelly, Pablo Sieg, Jill Majid, Kevin Bonilla, Nicole Economies, Mathilde Cohn, and Jane Anderson. She would also like to thank Max again, and uh, our colleague Tyrone, who's not here tonight, and helping with the setup. Because of the nature of tonight's reading, uh, suggests its own end. We won't have a formal Q&A, but there will be an, uh, an informal moment at the end. If you do have questions for Andrea, she's happy to welcome them directly. Um, thank you again, and enjoy. And then, and then, I can still see a big, almost empty garage warehouse in New York, with only a woman in it, often smoking and sipping a cup of tea. A woman visiting a city that has just lost a lot, a country that has lost its assumed innocent, innocence and prosperity. It's funny, but I don't picture this woman in this city. Well, she's, she did somewhat of a portrait of the city and her in it with great affection 34 years prior. She looked down alleyways, cars, trash, empty cobblestone streets, the river in a distance, sunset. Scenes in the subway revealing its colorful steel columns that no doubt inspired Blinky Palermo's paintings to the people of New York, at least an artist friend thought so. And there are avenues full of crowds moving, cars moving, New York in an expanse moving, like her, the young filmmaker who was spending days at a time at Anthology Film Archive, seeing New York avant-garde cinema. 
She had recently met the cine cinematographer she would work with closely for years to come. She liked this woman behind her movie camera. She was someone she could trust, she could work with, learn with, make with. A bit older than her, she introduced her not only to the films, but the filmmakers of the avant-garde. They had shot the film about New York together from cars and from tripods rigged up on sidewalks. For the voiceover, she reads letters from her mother, now past, recounting details of her life back home, a life like any other, I hear her say later in an interview. When I think about this woman reading in the empty garage about the loss of her father and the loss of so much in the camps, I remember her voice, somber and present, taking pauses to light a cigarette from a package on the table in front of her. I also remember my thankfulness for a place to be in the midst of a traumatized city, the closest spatial proximity my personal life had ever been to a physical act of war. I often thought about the randomness, randomness of being born in places and at times that do or do not engulf us in war, the randomness of being birthed into trauma, physically or ideologically. And what that specificity of this accident calls out in us throughout our lives steered by choices. I had just moved to the city a few years prior. I too was spending days at that time at the Anthology Film Archive watching avant-garde film, trying to make sense of the city's urban landscape through my still camera. Throughout the reading, she takes pauses to drink some tea. She looks up at me with her beautiful blue light eyes. It is the first time I see her in person. When I look at her, I feel the uncanny intimacy to her younger self, about my age then, when I had encountered her by watching her films and her in it as a young woman, writing, reading, cooking, cleaning, polishing shoes, running upstairs to classical music, getting undressed, looking out the window, smoking, eating an apple, and making love. Tonight she's not here, but her smoky, determined voice lingers in our ears. She's like that, here and not there, not here, from the reading to the book, something to share. I still listen for her voice. She gets dressed, she puts on some makeup, not too much. Someone comes to pick her up from the apartment and brings her to the space. It is the Australian curator one of the people she really loves to have a dialogue with. This curator asks questions wonderfully, always in an open way. The first time she meets her, it was the day after a party for one of her films. She had drunk too much the whole night. She barely slept. Suddenly the bell rings. She opens the door and the curator is here. She doesn't even remember anymore if she was even supposed to see her that day. She didn't even know who she was. This curator is pure, in a way, without being a purist. And she's made me think a lot, one of the best thinkers when it comes to art these days. I'll do my reading in October. I ask for a little table, a chair, a tablecloth on the table, a teapot and a cup, tea in the teapot, a mic. I don't know where, but probably in front of me. I'll be reading from big pages, so I should turn the pages slowly to not make too much noise into the mic. What else? It's going to be long. It takes about an hour and a half, I hope. I won't take more time in English, of course. For me, it's always more difficult to read in English. But it's hard to cut this text. I already tried unsuccessfully. They love her in this city, I think. It's her close followers those who accept her as a shifty narrator, like her closest family, the family that is far away. She had started to make movies when she was 18, unabashedful, not knowing how hard it was for a girl in Brussels. She made movies in that family that did not care about film. They weren't interested in it, but she was. And if they saw nothing in their past lives worth talking about, it was that nothing which interested her. 
She stays in touch with them, mostly through letters and Skype. It's not the same, of course, sitting with them than sitting here in front of friends and strangers. It is not the same as being picked up in the car, being lauded, seeing a young woman smiling timidly at her from the front row. And others too, her students, the curator's friend and a man, someone's husband, I think, talking kindly to her with humor after the applause ends. He's so good humored, this man. In fact, she wonders sometimes if it is humor or not, but since she knows he's a good humored man, she takes it for humor and she laughs with all her heart and kisses everyone and it feels good in her bones. It is hard to feel good in your bones around men you don't really know these days and it's only getting harder. Sometimes someone remembers that reading she did and that city and that time, some, often something small about it. Yes, not always, but often. That time was something that was its own thing in its own way. It was dark and heavy and full of ghosts. It feels so long ago now. Some people she knows were just children then. I remember Colonel West saying on the radio, what happened was the niggerization of the American people, quote, when you're niggerized, you're unsafe, unprotected, subject to random violence, hated for who you are, end quote. She also remembers that. She had followed the advice of a friend and put wet towels into the window frames of her apartment, and she kept the air purifier running to keep the smell outside, the smell of what happened and what was about to come. When she speaks with some of her friends about this time today, they smile and even laugh. There was nothing amusing about it, but the way we could not imagine what would happen next. Everyone agrees about that. All right. Now she decided she'll start her reading. She feels there's always something scary about beginnings, but you can leave the fear behind and don't look back, otherwise you will become a stone, she thinks. She's ready to brave the world, but the world does not care about her bravery, she adds. The next morning she wakes up to try to think about how she will do it. If she can find a form or concept, she will somehow manage. She will use that hidden part of herself again without realizing it. Every day she tidies her apartment, she sits at her computer and stares out at a building. She sees a woman doing Tai Chi. I should do some Tai Chi, she thinks. If I try, I'd be less tense and tension blocks me. It needs to stop. Suddenly, after walking the dog, she feels relaxed. She runs to her computer, it's now or never. They say never say never, or it might never come. So she says, it's now, and adds the word, maybe. She's glad she did, did that because nothing comes. What exactly did I get a glimpse of before? Why do I forget everything I thought of earlier? I watched Chantal Ackerman about Chantal Ackerman and I panicked. I just had to say that. She's not smug nor proud of starting that early, but the world, word unabashed strikes her. She compares and she wonders, am I enough unabashed now? The answer comes easy, much less. She's no longer that girl that does not realize. It's easy when you don't realize. For years she did not realize. Few people saw her films and she asked no one for money. The films cut no cost nothing and nobody saw them, it was easy. From Jeanne Dillman on, things were less easy, but she kept on at it. Yet she never considered her life being a career, because if you have a career, you have a plan. She always did what she liked, what she cared about, and what interested her. And she thought if she, and she thought if she's interested, she doesn't see why others wouldn't be interested as well. And so I left, a tiny white room on the ground floor, as narrow as a corridor, where I lie, motionless and attentive, on my mattress. The first day, I painted the furniture blue. The second day, I painted it all green. The third day, I put it all in the hallway. The fourth day, I laid down on the mattress, 
The room feels larger than I thought. Dans la danse, voyez comme on danse. Entrez dans la danse, voyez comme on danse. Sautez, dansez, embrassez qui vous voudrez. Sautez, dansez, embrassez qui vous voudrez. Nous n'irons plus au bois, les lorées sont coupées. La belle que voilà, les auras ramassées. Entrez dans la danse, voyez comme on danse. Sautez, dansez, embrassez qui vous voudrez. She sits and she waits until her courage comes back. Her courage travels a lot. Just today, in fact, she asked her courage to come back to be there for this event facing the ghosts. She needed to be with, with her 17 years ago when she walked up the West Side Highway with her back to the lit up TV camera tents camped out near Canal Street day and night. The, the river next to her quiet. People in the city were consumed by a deep silence. Thinking of words carefully, as they realized that one needed diligent words to account for what was happening, but that came later. For a short moment, there was no commentary, no headline, just silence, and the presence of that which was gone. Earlier that day, she had heard on the radio that the air was safe to breathe. The air she was breathing walking up the river that night ended up killing so many that helped with the cleanup. She and a friend were waiting outside, alongside the wall of the building, before the doors open. There were others in that group of people waiting, huddled together on the empty street that night, that she would meet a few years later and become close to. It makes her smile to think about these things now, feeling the imminent potential of these friendship possibly sketched in the heavy air that night. When they finally were let in through the gray door following a small corridor, the space felt large with only a modest number of chairs set up in front of a table. She sat down in the front row on the right side. She liked sitting in the front row, face to face. It made sense for her habit of frontal framing. Face to face is like an ethical order, which concerns the relationship to the other, something Levinas analyzed so well. Your face to face with the other, your sense of responsibility begins. Levinas would say, now that you understand, you can't murder. After her first breakdown, she forgot almost everything she learned in the weekly seminars she attended with Emmanuel Levinas and a few with Gilles Deleuze. Yet the idea of the face-to-face -face she did not forget. That's her idea of ethics. It's why she wants equality always between the image and the spectator or the passage from one unconscious towards the others. She knows she can count on her courage, except that sometimes her courage moves far away, and counting on something that feels far away is not the same as counting on something that lives inside. If she didn't restrain herself, she would ask for more courage that would do it for her, but she restrains herself. Courage has its own life, everyone does, especially when when you are far away and even when you're nearby. Except when you're nearby, you can feel it when you say, see you soon. Sometimes you don't see her soon. 
And sometimes when she's far away, you don't call on her anymore, or almost never. But that had not happened to her yet, and she thinks that she should stop thinking about it. She knows it's time to begin the reading, and she lights a cigarette. I don't, <coughs> I don't know if to throw a film like Jean Dillman into my mother's face, <coughs> never good to eat an apple and speak. <coughs> I don't know if to throw a film like Jean Dillman into my mother's face was very generous of me because it's true, she saw herself in it, as well as all of my aunts and many people of that generation, many people from that background, women. It was a world of confinement and of repetition. One had to know what to do at noon, then at 12.05, and then at 1 p.m., and then a week later. Ultimately, I don't know how, I, I know she understood it, but I don't know how she felt about it because it was also undoubtedly thrown in the face of women of that generation and from that world. A kind of mirror that wasn't necessarily something they appreciated seeing. I just found out, I never knew, but someone told me last week, she never told me herself, that my mother took piano lessons after leaving the camps. Then her own daughter comes and makes this film, Jeanne Dillman. And I show something I can feel within her and her aunts, and is something that leaves no space for piano lessons or for anything else for that matter. Only the repetition, the obsession, the confinement, the corridors and the kitchen. The first film I made was a world where everything took place in a kitchen, but it was destroying that world. Indeed, it was called Saute Ma Vie, Blow Up My Town, but it was also Saute Ma Vie, Blow Up My Life. Everyone knows what's going on in the world, and with what's going on, her mother rather not think about everything. If she thinks about it, she starts thinking about everything that she doesn't let herself think about. She's very good at not letting herself think about what she doesn't want to think about. At least she's trying to be good at it. She's trying, and it's so tiring. That's why she's always so tired, why she was always so tired. When she thinks about her mother, she tries not to repeat this not thinking. She fights it. It fights herself. It's quite a fight. Breaking away from repetition, repetition woman, repetition filmmaker, repetition second generation Jew, repetition woman, queer, music, burlesque, comedy, repetition violence, repetition silence, repetition ghost. But she also knows if she had to start thinking about everything she's thinking about, she'd be so full of thought that she wouldn't even be able to find a good way to be present and therefore be far away from all these relations that brought her here, sitting on 22nd Street. But she needs to be sitting here and tell stories about places and people, about connections made and missed, about, reconnection, about a reconnection of a past and her past, about institutions and collections, about choices made, difficult choices for some and not for others. And being here, being with relations makes her think in a different way. It makes her think about traces that are ungraspable, but here among us, whatever we do, no one can uninvite the ghosts. 
A friend whose ancestor walks this land tells me that everything that ever happened in a place remains. It makes me think of candles on a cake, the ones that come on again, no matter how hard you try to blow them off. Without subject or object, without start or end, a film that implodes between Eden and catastrophe, in progress in shards, shards of catastrophe. A film that reproduces itself at least four times, maybe five, as it's taken towards catastrophe, as the speed of light seems to be surpassed, like a Hiroshima, and like at Hiroshima, it leaves its traces, but in progress. A film that explodes and floats between dying, next to it the phantoms still are swaying, they continue their danse macabre. A film that replicates itself until it has lost its colors, like shadows, phantoms, traces. A film that comes together in a landscape and drifts apart, from black and white to white and black, almost unidentifiable, often almost abstract forms. That's how it will become an orphaned film, without, without author, without subject, no object, silent. Her father started to buy paintings at the end of his life, often at auction, bad paintings, but he liked them. And he always thought he had found a bargain and when she came, he would take on this air of his, a special little air full of humor, and he'd say, have you noticed something different in the house? And right away, she would say, there's a new painting. And he'd get up and start turning on all the lights so she could see it better and give her opinion of it. And she would look at it carefully, and she would say, what a beautiful painting. This time you've really gotten a bargain, and it's very beautiful, and the frame too, and it changes the whole apartment. And then he'd get his little air about him again and say, guess how much I paid for it. And he'd finish by telling her how much, and everybody agreed that he had gotten a bargain. Her father never saw her as an artist, but as a filmmaker, a cineast, until a curator who was working in the Midwest asked her to do something for a museum gallery. She hadn't even thought of it herself as an artist either. Because she was asked, and she likes to please those who support her, she set herself to it. An installation piece is cinema without the hassle. That is, with all the humiliating terms of production. It's free of all the burdens of cinema. I can work alone at home without waiting to find the money. It's artisanal work, practiced by hand, which I adore. There's nothing like it. Installations offer her a different way of working with moving images, with audiences, and with sound. She always loved the sound. For one film on the set, she had asked the actress to put on one pair of heels after another until the sound they made on the floor was just right. To make art is wonderful, but the art world did not always like her installations, which upset her. The market, has driven, has, the market that drives it is full of politics. It's often tied to power, to the phallus, but not always. But in the end, art is a danger to only serve the rich, not the people. Before the war, the gallery owners kept the artists alive not through speculation, but through love for the artists and their works. Again, nothing is simple. Even when it's exhibited often in palaces, art becomes just the exhibition of a limitless ego. But all the same, it's good that it gets shown. She realized that it is harder when it does not get shown, when it is made but not shown, 
when it is made but not seen and not cared for, that worries her. She worries about all the work that is not cared for, or all the work that is never made because no one asked for it, or even more difficult, the work that to begin with no one recognized as work being made. The three friends who started this institution many years ago set out to care for art, two women and one man. He very much liked both of the women for their understanding of art, but he fell in love with only one of them. The women both from Houston, Texas joined him in New York where the three of them started to dream about art that did not yet exist. They could dream big because one of the women owned significant stocks in oil and oil was big in this country back then and today again, it still enables a lot of art. The men liked to talk about the art in the post-war German conf in the confinements of post-war Germany in contrast to America's open possibilities. He grew up in Germany, living through the war as a child. He felt drawn to America and especially New York because of the artists he had met and shown in his gallery back home. In the early 1970s, he finally moved his operation to New York. During this time, the East Village, Harlem, and Soho were buzzing with artists making work inside of gallery spaces and on the streets, in living rooms and storefronts, in containers left on streets, in factories, old school houses, on rooftops, in alleyways, and on empty piers. They made music, food, they danced, they wrote poetry, they photographed, painted, welded, and weaved. Color and form, history, storytelling, abstraction, and figuration were everywhere. The three friends stayed downtown. That's what excited them. It made them feel good in their bones. He had let an artist fill his gallery with earth, and he took her money and started their new work looking for projects that could not be realized in the confinements of the art world. They bought warehouse buildings and searched for land out west to dream up work outside of being valuable for a market, but instead being valuable for their ideas. This ambition was not that different to the artists at the time working in the East Village, in Soho and Harlem, but different in funding, scale and temporal ambition. The friends were looking for great gestures for eternity in a moment of great and complex specificity. Not surprising maybe then, Greek mythology gave the name for their project, Dia, after the God, Greek word meaning through. They paid a group of artists monthly salaries to develop their ideas and their imaginations. A group of white men and one woman were given resources and space to make impossible works possible and to sustain their lives for a few years outside the confinements of making a living. The artists took the money and went to work. The sole woman they supported had worked with Amir Baraka and Jack Smith prior to working with the men this institution supported. In the midst of so much, the three friends dreamed with so little. They did not dream with the girlfriends and wives, the women's studio mates, the artists working in Harlem or in the West Coast. There was, for example, the artist in San Francisco who made large weaves of wire at night and in the early morning hours when it was quiet. She suspended them from the ceiling, maybe so her six children could not reach them during the day. Her family had been placed in the camps in the 1940s on the West Coast. And then there was the artist who did shows with Betty Parson, but then left to live and make work on the vernacular architecture in the South. There were also the artists shown in the deluxe show in Houston that one of the women worked on prior to coming to New York. But again, these artists were not part of the three friends dreaming. When I first moved to this country, I thought that my friend from the other side overdid it in her, her reproachfulness, but by now I wonder if she finally wasn't right. In any case, it's something to talk about. Otherwise, what else is left to say? I say to my friend from the other side, as long as I can hear your voice on the telephone, I'm all right, and I can tell you are all right. We have to plan for that. 
You always say you're all right when I ask you if you're all right, but sometimes you say it in a way that's so distracted that I know you're thinking about something else, and right after that, you always say, I have to go now. When you say, I have to go now without adding anything, then I sit there and I think about you, or rather I don't think. I just sit there as if something was missing and something is still missing. So I sit there by the fo phone and I feel a little cold. If all of a sudden the phone rings again and my other friend who calls from so far away, never mind the money, then the cold leaves me and I answer with liveliness. My other friend can tell right away that I was cold and she asked me right away, what's the matter? And is something the matter? And I answer her and it's true now that I'm fine and she's, she heard wrong, no doubt, because of the long distance. And also I was just yawning and that's why she thought I didn't sound right. You yawned, are you tired? No, I just felt like yawning. I love yawning. It does me so much good, almost as much as laughing. Then I ask, how are the children and the husband, and what are they doing? And are they doing, going to the beach for the weekend? And she says, no, not this weekend. I say, that's true, you can't go every week. And so we talk like this, and the coldness of the missing person seems to disappear. And she gives her husband the phone and then the kids and they don't say much, but I ask them about school and friends and then we say, see you soon on the phone, see you soon. And I hang up and the cold is gone and I get dressed and put up my makeup and go to catch the subway to go to the studio. When she arrives at the studio, she lays down on her back in the middle of the space and th she thinks about her friend from the other side. It's hard to find out and to tell everything, but she guesses the rest. She's very good at guessing the rest. And she knows that her friend from the other side wants to tell her things about this and that, and about this institution, about the ghosts wandering its collection halls and storage spaces. But her friend from the other side does not tell her everything. When her friend from the other side says she has to go now because she needs to take a break to do some care, there again, she guesses the rest, but this time, the, but this rest, she knows how to guess. She has seen it before in other friends, in students, and in mentors. She has done it herself. That does not mean she knows what her friend is thinking and doing, but she knows the circumstance in which they are thinking and doing and caretaking, and that gives her energy too. When her friend from the other side says, I have to go now because I have to take a break, that gives her energy and she thinks harder about it all and she also chooses to do something to feed the ghosts. And sometimes in that thinking and doing, I remember what made everyone laugh and I, laugh, and I call my friend from the other side back and we love and we feel good in our bones together. She really liked smoking, and she smoked a lot in the bathroom. It's a habit she picked up when she was young. From time to time, I would say, don't smoke so much. I don't understand why you don't suffocate in that bathroom of yours. Her mother smoked, too, and she would tell her not to smoke so much, just as a matter of form, because smoking didn't really bother her, and it would stop right there. Still, sometimes her mother would say, You've already smoked a whole pack. I can hear it in your voice. It's bad for you. It tires you out. And she would say, no, I haven't. And it would stop there. To me, she says, it's true. I do smoke too much. I know it's not good for her. It tires her out, but everything tires her out. I'm just someone who's tired all the time, except sometimes when I forget myself. It's pretty rare that I do that, forget myself. It has to be an occasion like a party, a big party with the whole family together, a party where there's dancing. Then I forget myself and I dance. Now, with what's going on all around us, I don't dance anymore. Besides, I don't think I've been to a big party since things have been the way they are. But if I did go, I don't think that I would dance. Yet at parties, I used to dance with everyone. My friends are like me, the ones from the other side and the other ones, they all love to dance together. 
these are the things I think about when I have good thoughts and when we talk about things and it's not often because it's not often that all my friends are with me in the same time. It's a good talk because right away after a moment of silence while we look around at each other and smile or even cry sometimes, we hug each other and we feel, to, feel together and we feel like close family and there's nothing closer than family. And so I feel the need to say it's so rare we're all together like this and it's so good for us. I can't help saying it even though I know that my friends wish I wouldn't. I can tell they'd rather I didn't say it because even though they say yes it is or you're right, I notice that they look a little distracted. Parties were often in the winter time and when it was over we took our coats from the coat room and I wouldn't even put mine on. I was not so hot and sweaty. I even had beads of sweat on my upper lip. And she'd like, she didn't like it, and she'd say, wipe yourself off, but very nicely, so I wouldn't take it badly. I, wouldn't, I would put, wouldn't put my coat on, just throw it over my shoulders. It was a fur coat. First, it was long, and then I had it shortened. And she liked me to wear this fur coat, which would have cost a lot of money, and it took years before I had one. And then finally, I didn't have to wait anymore, and we went together to order it, and the furrier gave us a good price because we'd known each other for a long time. And there, after the party, I simply slipped it over my shoulders. I waited there while she went to get the car, there in the cold. The cold felt good and dry, and I felt so good, not tired or anything while other couples leaving the party like us were yawning and gasping, saying that they were tired, not me. I felt absolutely fantastic. When I came home, I hung that coat on the coat rack and I liked it there, even when I was not wearing it for a while. I kept it on the coat rack to see it every time I entered the house. The coat on the coat rack made me feel like home. Now that I'm gone, I wonder if my coat is still there. She had written a proposal for a film a few years back, thinking that this institution might be able to support her in her work. She does not like asking for money, but there was no way around it. Making movies, feeding the crew and their families if they had any. She only needed to feed herself and her dog. She doesn't have any children. She doesn't care, or maybe she does, she can't tell. Her mother didn't care. All the other women of her mother's age do care if one of their children doesn't have any children. It makes them think and gives them dark thoughts. But not her mother. Sometimes she wonders why. She tells herself, I'm not like the others. She's not sure though, because the others are hard to get to know. And it's even hard to know herself, because she'll think she knows herself, and then suddenly she'll be thinking something and says, I surprised myself. Finally, she doesn't know herself and knows others even less. The thing that worries her mother is that she thinks a lot, and maybe she thinks too much, especially when she starts talking too much and her words come straight out of her thoughts. She starts talking too much and too fast that comes from thoughts that are racing, racing so fast that it's not even a thought anymore. And afterwards, she doesn't feel well at all, and there's nothing to do but wait for it to pass for her to think normally again, that is, the way she usually thinks, because after a, after a while, it does pass. She returns to thinking about the proposal she needs to finish for this institution and the curator who's waiting to consider it. She's still in Paris instead of being on the road in Mexico, production problems, delays and so on. She will only leave this coming Thursday then she will have to start a few days, stop a few days in Mexico to meet some people, find money and find an assistant. Well, all that means that instead of having been five or six weeks before arriving in New York to do the reading, I'll only have a little bit more than three. That's too dangerous for the film and for the reading 
I can't do it. It seems that each time her and the curator she likes so much want to do something together, there's always something that interferes in the worst way. Last year, she had plenty of time, but the curator didn't have the money. This year, the curator has the money, and her time is shrinking more every day. She doesn't want the curator to be put in an unbearable situation, so she sits down at her computer. Proposal. My Harvard students have been telling me about this film, Gamo, for months. I had made a tremendous it had made a tremendous impression on them. Some of them even say this film had changed their lives, the way we used to say to each other about Godard 30 years ago. Some spoke of it with such fervor that, they'd went, that I went to see it. I didn't see it all at once, but stopped in several days in a row. I used to go to the film archive at Harvard all the time. I almost lived there, and it was easy for me to go in and come out. With this film, I always wanted to come out, but just the same, I kept coming back, not to see what would happen next, but just to see a bit more. Mostly I was angry. Of course I fought it, but just the same, I was angry. I wondered, I really wanted to understand what it was about that had, was a, what it was about it that had changed my student's life. I couldn't have been just the form of the film, which I didn't find very interesting, but it was no doubt the content. In the end, and above all, the content, or the content in that form was what pained me. They believe all these stories about those white people in Ohio, stories about people with no superego, no culture or past, with children who kill cats or their parents with no rhyme or reason, incidentally. They believe in this world made up of monsters, as if that's just the way it is, monster society has serenely produced. Yes, it pained me, and I felt like responding with another film. It's true, in the world, people aren't like that, no. Those white people can't be like that, calmly killing just like that, with no super ego, no hate even, no culture, no history, no past, maybe, no doubt. But not just like that, and anyway, that couldn't be what fascinated my students. What does fascinate these kids? Maybe it's precisely a representation of this no culture and no super ego in Puritan America, or for them, was it a response to that Puritan America, which could only have been built on the blood of Indians and the enslavement of blacks? Some people have too much history and too much past, Europeans certainly, and others maybe not enough, Americans, no questions about it. Some organize killings, even genocide, because of or in the name of this too much history, this history of territory and land, of race and religion, even of too much culture. There are others whose lack of history, a past, a culture, or even a vague memory of a culture, of a place they left to go elsewhere, somewhere great and new, somewhere that was somewhere else, leads them to suppress what bothers them, the excess, and also what seems unfit to be fully realized, the utopia of this new world. Thus, every, everything started from that, from the desire to respond. So I said to myself, I should go somewhere and film this response, but America is huge. I should choose some route that made sense, even if it were a bit erratic. I had no desire to cross America from sea to sea, from New York to Los Angeles, a mythical path to be sure, but one that had been covered a thousand times. I remembered the book, Let Us Now Praise Famous Man, by James Agee and Walker Evans which also took place in the deepest America, in the very heart of the South, not far from Birmingham. I remembered the wonderful characters, how wonderful they were in their complexity, and the beautiful photographs by Walker Evans who documented them and their lives. Yes, they were beautiful figures, but wasn't it Aji who wanted them to be? And their wretchedness, the wretchedness of people living off the land, poor but with dignity, as they say, was not devoid of beauty, an arid beauty perhaps, but beauty nonetheless, even stronger because so arid. And even though in the photographs of those farmers so marked by their poverty, you could discern a kind of madness in their stare. 
But nothing in Evans' photographs taken in the th South at the end of the 1930s suggested even for a moment the brutality perpetrated in the th South by human beings, whites, against other human beings, blacks. What you saw in all its beauty is what their poverty had done to those whites, and you, saw, and you said to yourself, in all its perversity, it's beautiful. These are beautiful photographs. And as a spectator, you didn't feel stricken or affected in your integrity as a human being because your first feeling is that against wind and tide, the people described and photographed nonetheless remained human beings. It was Gamo that in its own way was a response to let us now praise famous men and to other works, films or books where human dignity is despite everything preserved. And then because of the South, I thought of another book and how haunted I was by it, about other travels through the South, those of the main characters in James Baldwin's book, Harlem Quartet, the young black gospel singers. You must have, Im have been around, it must have been around the beginning of the 1960s and they were f when they were first beginning to talk about desegregation. They were there at great risk and danger to themselves really knowing what they were doing. So many feelings, so many sentences from this book seemed familiar to me. I'd heard them before at home in Brussels, uttered by my father and my mother, whose own history in so many respects differed from that of Baldwin and his characters. And yet these sentences I'd always been obsessed with were common to them all, phrases linked to fear, meager phrases that barely escaped, and of course, much more striking than a flood of words, or rather, those meager phrases that sometimes slip despite themselves into the midst of wordiness, telling the happiness of the day. And I'll quote Baldwin. There's total silence, the silence of the South, a heavy, tense silence, a leaden silence, a silence that was supposed to be peaceful, but isn't. We wait for a cry to break this silence. We fear the coming day." End quote. At home in my house, we didn't talk about the silence of the South when we talked about something, but about the silence of the camps. There was the same fear of the coming day, because with the coming day, nothing but the worst could happen. Like Baldwin, we also spoke of the same fear of walking in the middle of the sidewalk and the tendency of hugging the walls. This is no doubt why I was so haunted by the novel, because of the fear and the tension one feels in the book. They left New York by car at great risk and danger to themselves. They stopped whether to eat, go to the toilet, or sing in some hole in the wall in Richmond, Virginia, where on August 18, 1899, an unknown black was lynched, then in Charlotte and Monroe, North Carolina, then in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, then two miles from Nashville, Tennessee, and then in Birmingham, Mobile, and Montgomery, Alabama. Baldwin described Birmingham as a fat, spread out, lavish city, a city incapable of arousing the slightest hope, a most in in iniquitous and detestable city with broad, deserted streets that cross at right angles but lead to a horrific future. The low houses conspires, trees abund. He had never seen so many trees. The trees remind Baldwin of all those hanged in the slow and heavy, luxurious air. He writes further on, quote, I'm not the only Negro who dreams of Birmingham and wakes up in a cold sweat and stifling cry, end quote. This too is horribly familiar. Birmingham, where Rosa Park refused to move to the back of the bus, those gospel singers also went to Atlanta, Georgia, to the suburbs and the backwoods, and then to a small town of which Baldwin says only that it's not far from John, John Brown's body. I said to myself, all I have to do is follow that route, their route. No doubt go all the way to Florida just like they did and film. And then there was a new racial incident that's what they call it, a lynching, really, in Jasper, Texas. So I also go to Jasper, Texas. Perhaps I will be able to better see or understand what it is that still and always obsesses me so.
Perhaps I will see it better in the town of Jasper, Texas, which thinks it can heal or move on by putting up a sign on one of the streets in huge capital letters. Jasper, Texas is mourning, hurting, crying. America, please pray for us. That incident was followed by several others said to be less serious as if it had only reactivated something that is always latent, not just there, but elsewhere. There in Jasper, Texas, as in many other places all over the United States and the world, someone was killed in a most vicious hate crime. Yes, I want to go and see at what price the American miracle is happening and on whose backs the greatest amassing of wealth ever seen is being created and whether this landscape preserves the traces or even the memory, whether its trees tell of something other than their own beauty. To film nature, the nature that conceals blood and carnal, that reflection of heaven in a muddy wallow, the memory, perhaps, imaginary of a trip to the country and, of course, lying on the ground topsy-turvy, a heat you can hear, the bees and mosquitoes, all is still, yet everything moves. I would like to create images that evoke almost too much happiness, and by going over things, turning them over and again, I hope to make you waltz with the pleasure produced by nature, the landscape, a trip to the countryside, pleasure and its quivering to the point of doubting that pleasure, of feeling horror, perhaps even a feeling for the tragic amidst the, le amidst the leaden silence. She had sent the three, three typewritten pages and attached them to an email. They were in French and would need to be translated when they arrived. She thought about her life existing in translation, between language and culture, between the ghost and the living. You can explain when you want to, but you don't want to, Delphine said to her when she was working with her on Jan Dillman. As a young director, she explained the character and her movement to the actress for every shot and detail, because she did not see the need to have any improvisation in the acting. The actress struggles but goes along. She always wanted the actress to do as exactly as she marked in her scripts. Everything was so clear to her, but it was hard to translate, especially early on. The institution did support the film, but they never showed it. It wasn't a good fit. She ended up making a film mostly about Jasper and the silence that had become so heavy and so menacing so suddenly, and about how the past calls out this present, about wandering along an empty cotton field or a dusty country road and the haunt and the torment it made her feel. Later, someone said she was looking to find a reflection of her own past, her own family's history in the American South and looking for herself, she was missing the other. A situation and a repetition, all at the same time. Repetition history, repetition woman, repetition bloodshed, repetition silence. So they did not show the film and she's not part of the collection. When she's together with friends, they don't talk about that. Sometimes they don't talk at all. We just eat each think and not always about that. We talk about the dog that was left behind in Meli Monton and we laugh about the dog's name, which in our language means filthy, and that he deserves his name and what a funny idea to give a dog like that a name like that. Her close family were always looking for likenesses everywhere, even between dogs and their masters, and she would ask herself, as far as dogs and their masters were concerned, was it the dogs who end up looking like their masters or mistresses or vice versa? Either way, it was true and she wondered if she would end up looking like her dog, dog and vice versa. Anyway, she and many others are not part of this collection. Sometimes there's not enough money, sometimes there's not enough time 
and sometimes there's not enough work that can be bought. Who got to do a lot of work back then in their studios? But we don't talk about that when we are together. No one really does. It's complicated and it's uncomfortable. And then everyone is so busy now all the time and maybe too busy to ask who is going to work today to have money to feed the dog, to pay the studio rent, to pay the assistant as a wage and to feed the crew, to feed the family. Sundays, her family would often invite people over, so her father would go to the pastry shop with the car and bring back cakes, delicious cakes. He would say, and everyone would have to take a piece, and him too, he would take one. It made him happy, like having grandchildren made him happy. It was him who cared that his daughter was neither, had neither a husband nor children. That's how he was. It worried him. He wouldn't say anything to her about it, but it did worry him tremendously, and he didn't understand. He thought there must be something wrong. Of course, he knew that she was the kind of girl who did whatever she wanted, so why couldn't she just as easily want to get married? But she wouldn't marry, so she must not have wanted to. He never said anything to her, but he was sure that she knew he was worried by it. Sometimes he managed not to worry about it, and they, he would see his daughter just as she was and love her just as she was. But he was worried. His daughter didn't say much, and he didn't say much either, but they didn't need to. His wife said a lot. Not that needed to be said necessarily, but she just said it. She loved everyone, and she always needed to say that she loved. He recognized this need in her, so he never said, you've told me already. But he'd said yes, and then he would become a little vague. She was never vague, really. On the contrary, when she said many times about the same people that she loved them so much, she ended up adding that they also loved her. Then she would pass on to other things. When in 1990, she submitted a text that expressed her desire to make a film on Eastern Europe, she said, I would like to film there in my documentary way, verging on fiction, about everything, everything that touches me. Faces, bits of street, passing cars, buses, stations and planes, rivers and seas and so on. What do we do and how do we do it so as not to fall into that exoticism where the other becomes so other that in the end he or she or they no longer exist? Or rather, its image is decided in advance in order to tame it, all the better, to annul it. As soon as you touch the Middle East, as Jabez says, the problem of the alien, the foreign and the foreigner, and thus the problem of the self-hate for the foreign, Thus, hate for the self comes up in radical fashion. And this hate of the other can catch you by surprise, obliquely and almost treacherously, at any time and with no rhyme or reason. As, happens to, as happened to her that year in Jordan, in Aqaba, where she went that summer to confront her desire to make this film. It wasn't much, just some footsteps. The sound of these footsteps dragging at first, she paid no attention, but then she heard a voice inside of her say, don't drag your feet. Even more urgently, she liked directing this injunction to the other person. She ended up resenting that other, almost hating him, because she was dra he was dragging his feet. She sees an aggression here, a deadly one that leads to deadly hate and to the very hate of that hate. This hate spills over onto the body of the other, that other dragging his feet, and of course, of what she associates with it, this manner of being, his position, to the women who walk behind him and not next to him. But she couldn't do anything about the sound of the feet dragging on the ground. 
And of course, the story about the woman walking behind the man led to other stories, like the horrible one about the boy, no doubt an American, he couldn't have been more than 18, who hurled himself, literally hurled himself against the wall of a small synagogue in Sfat, where he, spot he spotted her there inside the walls. He threw himself against the wall in outrageous fashion, in a kind of masochistic climax, to avoid the possibility of his eyes meeting hers, those of a woman, an impure woman. He must have come for what they call in Hebrew the return, a return to religion. Like many other young French or Americans walking about Sfat, the holy city, or Jerusalem, another holy city. These young people who won't shake hands with you or even address you have a kind of identity by tensing up. They search at times for a fate or a strong belief, but mostly they're in search for a harsh law. There too, she had been caught up in hate, but without dodging it, she could take the liberty since they were, quote, both Jews. She felt like hitting him, calling him an asshole or worse, and telling him that this will to purify would mean the end of us all, that we were heading towards a slaughter. I want to film in order to understand, taking the risk of perhaps not understanding anything at all as I film. The second commandment, the one that forbids representation, corresponds to a certain wishful thinking on my part about nomadism, as well as to the idea that the land one possesses is always a sign of barbarism and blood, while the land one traverses without taking reminds me of a book. What are you going there for, someone asked someone else. I'll find out when I get there, someone else said. It's always your mother and your father you run into on a journey. And I have to say that she's right. At the end of my last film, I said to myself, before the first frame, I already knew those images. They were there, right inside of me. It nearly drove her father crazy not to be able to remember words. When he couldn't find a word, a simple word that he had said a thousand of times, he had to call me to help him find it. And that took forever, because often I really didn't know what he was talking about. And he would try so hard, and when I finally got the word, he would be relieved and horrified at the same time that it was such a simple word. They had told him to read newspapers to stay in touch with words, and he tried to do it, though it tired him out. And when he did read, he remembered all the words. It was only when he spoke that he couldn't remember them. Forgetting words is losing a tool to make sense of the world around you. With words, I can be part of the conversation. I can tell stories of my life, of the people I met in the subway, the food I ate, or the book I just finished. In this way, losing words is losing out on being part of life. Maybe I would even say that losing words is losing a part of your life, a missing piece in a picture. Losing people in one's life feels like that too. You know they were there, you can feel them, yet they are gone. They are in your head like the missing word that you were so familiar with. That you, used to, that you used without thinking. But now they're gone. They will be missing from the way you can tell a story, from the way you can make sense of something. My grandmother was always a feminist. She wanted to become a painter and get married on her own. She was born in 1905, and her mother was very religious. She didn't get the life she wanted, no more than my mother, who admitted as much the day after my father died, with a kind of fury. This time I was the one who couldn't understand. 
Am I the repository of that all? Doubtless, all that and other stuff too. At first, when I started to make my work, I thought I was speaking out since my mother never had been able to. But now I know that's not it, that I never had a choice, not really. Well, I don't know. I lack the, kind of, the kind of drive to be constantly turning my thoughts into actions, but everything comes from the journal of my grandmother. When I got sick for the first time, my mother fled, but left me the diary of her mother. In 1919, at 15, she was writing, quote, it's only in you, dear diary, that I can confine my feelings and my grief since I'm a woman, end quote. So I tell myself, and I, th I like to think, even if it's not true, I still like to think it, that because she wrote these words into her diary, they never crossed my mind. I never thought, I'm a woman, so I don't what. The diary was the only thing that was left of my grandmother. I read it a dozen times. My mother wrote a couple of lines in it too, and I did too, then my little sister as well, a whole female tradition. Thanks to it, my mother never believed that men were superior. My grandmother would paint in secret on Saturdays. I would like to find her paintings. They disappeared in the turmoil. I like to think she worked in hiding. It may be not true, but I like to think it in hiding because in the religious community, images are forbidden. One day I asked my mother what, what they were paintings of. And the first thing my mother said was that they were huge paintings. I like how she said huge paintings. She said it calmly and forcefully. And I repeated, mimicking the voice, huge paintings. That said it all. That day, I asked no more questions. Another day, I asked what they were huge paintings of. I can't remember, my mother said. I was little. All I remember is that there were women in them. Faces, faces which could see me, that's all. Thank you.